Hi everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Water, Wind, Wine Ministries. Today I would like to talk to you about cleaning the temple. Now, I know that you think we are not Jewish, we don't worship in a temple, and then you've heard sermons about how this body, your body, is the temple of God. We are not Jewish, we are Christian, we don't worship in a temple, that's true, and your body is the temple of the living God. So what does it mean to clean the temple? Do I mean you need to stop smoking, you need to stop cussing, you need to stop drinking, you need to eat only organic food? Of course, I would love for you to do those things. I think that they're all very beneficial and very helpful. Jesus Christ said through the mouth of Paul that all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. But this video is not about that. What this video is going to cover is cleaning the temple. Now, it's going to be a little bit different than what you might think, so I urge you just to stick with me. Our study verse is going to come out of Matthew chapter 21 and we're going to look at verses 12 through 14 and I'm going to mention verse 15 just for argument's sake okay so follow along with me if you have your Bibles Matthew 21 verses 12 through 14 and then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and he said to them it is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. What we see, we, you know, you've heard this sermon before, I'm sure, in your church, or on YouTube, or, or in a podcast or something, or you've even read it. This verse actually is only one time that Jesus did this. He did this twice, where he went into the temple at Jerusalem and overturned the tables of the money changers. That is significant in and of itself, but I'm gonna put that aside for just a second. Now, I want you to understand what this scene looked like. This was not Jesus walking up to these money changers saying, hey guys, my father's house would be called a house of prayer and you're making a den of thieves, so can we move along? It wasn't that sweet and it also wasn't as a little bit more violent as you might be thinking where it says that he turned over their tables I don't want you to think that Jesus walked in there and said I need you to get out and flipped over their tables I don't want you to think that it was that calm either what this was was an extremely extremely violent moment in the life of Jesus Christ our Lord what he did was he actually made a scourge, a whip. A scourge is the same thing that they whipped him with when he went to the cross for your sins, for my sins, and for our diseases, and for our salvation. He was beaten with a scourge. You know, in Pilate's Praetorium, that's what they used to whip him with. So that's what Jesus made. He made a scourge, and he is driving these people out of the temple flipping over their tables, causing a huge commotion. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen people move cows. I move cattle, I moved horses, and sometimes, because they're stronger than you, they just get very stubborn and they sit back. And so sometimes you have to get a little bit violent with the lead rope, you have to get a little bit violent with the paddle, and to get this stubborn animal to move out of your way. And that's what I want you to picture in your head, is that Jesus is coming after these people. He is actually making them move, like swatting their butt, just pop, 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 getting them out of there and flipping over these tables. I'm going to extremes with this illustration so that you'll understand, so that you'll have a good mind picture of what I'm going to relate this to metaphorically and spiritually in your life and how that verse and that passage affects you. Now, it says that in verse 14, that after he was done, that then the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them in the temple. The blind and the lame, I want you to think about this. I mean, just use your reason for a second. Blind people can't see where they're going, okay? So I want you to think about just the blind people in this statement, that this temple is filled with all these money changers and we're gonna get into what they were doing in just a second and why Jesus was so angry and what that has to do with your life today. 
But I want you to think about blind people. We have all these money changers here, and the temple is there, and they want to go and they want to worship God because they're called by the Holy Spirit just like we are, but they can't see around the tables. And what if somebody comes that's new? So maybe the path that they had before isn't the same path because somebody's put their table in the way, and they're blind. They can't see it, so they're tripping and falling. And this is diminishing the money changers' business because these blind people are in the way, so the money changers, of course, would be shooing them off. Let's talk about the lame people. The lame people can't walk, right? So they can't even get up to go into the temple, but they're laying outside of the temple. We see this commonly in the book of Acts. We see it, you know, when the other apostles and the disciples came and they saw people at the temple begging alms. That's what people who were lame did in that day. They would sit at the door of the temple when people came to worship and they would beg for money, for alms. And so I'm sure that we have all these lame people sitting there, but they are being shooed off and run off because these people are changing the money of the worshipers who can see and the worshipers who can walk, right? Imagine it's like this. Imagine if you're at a flea market, okay? And you have all the tables set up and you go and you are selling at a flea market. You have your table set up and you want to sell at your flea market or at your swap meet or even at your own yard sale or garage sale. And then you have somebody who knows that people are going to come to wherever you are because they are coming to purchase whatever it is you have to purchase. So you know they have money. So this sounds like a really good opportunity for a person who needs to beg money to gain the money they need. So of course, if you're at this flea market, if you're at this swap meet, if you're having a garage sale, imagine that somebody comes and brings a lame person and plops them down in front of your garage sale, in front of your flea market table or swap meet table, and everybody that comes up, this lame person says, hey, do you have any for me, right? Pretty soon, your business is gonna go away. Are you following with me? This is really important. This is a key element to this. Now, we know that the lame had to be carried there. They're lame, that means they can't walk. We know that the blind had to be led there because like I said, these tables were not permanent. They could come and set up every day and sell these sacrificial animals. And that's what they were doing. They were changing the money for sacrificial animals. This is really important. These people who were selling and changing money, what they were selling was sacrifices. You know, the Old Testament, and this is when Jesus lived. Don't forget, Jesus did not live in the New Testament. He brought in the New Testament. He lived in the Old Testament. He lived under the Mosaic Law, 613 commandments, right? If you did this, you had to bring a pigeon. If you did that, you had to bring a this. All these commandments, that's what Jesus lived in. And so what was happening is that in the temple, people would come to worship God, and these people would be selling sacrifices they would be selling their animals so that they could be sacrificed. Now, catch this. God instituted animal sacrifice until Jesus could come. We are no longer under obligation to sacrifice animals. But I want you to think about how impactful this was. There's a purpose behind what God did besides just slaughtering animals for the sin of man, okay? There's a really, really heartfelt, deep purpose. Follow me, okay? I have horses, and I'm sure if you've watched these videos before, if you've watched my channel, you know that I have horses. I also have dogs. I love my horses. I love my dogs. I take very good care of both sets. I have a horse that I have raised since he was six months old. He looks at me very much like the leader of his herd. I adore this horse. Well, say that I raise this horse, and he's beautiful, by the way. I raised this horse, and then I did something wrong. But the sacrifice for what I did wrong happened to be a horse. And it had to be that horse. He has no blemishes. He has nothing wrong with him. He's beautiful. And so I would have to go and take this horse that I've raised since he was six months old. Now he's six years old. And I would have to lead him down to the temple myself and take him to the priest and say, I did this. Now my horse has to die. Think about how impactful that was. Those of you with out horses think about dogs my mother has chihuahuas and she loves those chihuahuas they are her constant companions and so imagine if my mother did something wrong these little tiny innocent chihuahuas that look to her for food and that she has companionship with and she does something wrong and she has to take them to the priest 
and the priest cuts their little throat. I know that's violent, but I want you to have a good picture of animal sacrifice. It's not sweet, it's not pretty, it's the most humane thing they can do is cut their throat quickly. Okay, so here's my point in saying all of that and giving such a violent and aggressive illustration. When people would have to bring their own personal animals, it had to be the best. It couldn't be just, you know, the one with, with a no working leg or the one that was so ugly that nobody wanted him. It had to be the perfect, the best one. When they brought their best animal for their sin sacrifice, it impacted them. It made a dent. It made a very long lasting scar in their heart that, oh my gosh, I had to lose my best animal. And even if they raised it for to sell, to go to market, their best one is gonna bring the best price. They have to sacrifice the most valuable animal they have because they screwed up. That is a big, big deal. And the impact that it has on a person's heart is don't screw up again. And that's part of the reason that God had them do it that way. So it'd be so meaningful, so impactful that they wouldn't do it again, okay? So now, catch up with me back to Matthew 21. These people who are set up in front of the temple, they're selling sacrifices. So what does this do to the hearts of those people who are going to the temple to worship? It does two things. Number one, it makes sin easier for them. In other words, they don't have to give up their most valuable animal because they can go to the temple and they can say, oh, here, I'll pay for this pigeon or that heifer or that sheep because I did this and that. And so they're not actually sacrificing anything that means something to them. Yes, the money is important to them and, you know, they have to work for that. But it's not the same thing as raising a baby animal, raising your best, absolute best animal and having to give it away because you screwed up. It's not the same thing. So now that that is one thing that happens to these people. So the hearts of the Jews that are going to worship in the temple, they're like, oh, sin shmin. Right? I can just work a little harder, make a little more money, and then I'll just go out and have a good time on Friday night right before Sabbath starts, and then I'll just buy whatever good animals are at the temple on, on Saturday. That's, that's the attitude, okay? So it puts them in a, in a nonchalant heart position towards sin. That's the first thing it does. The second thing it does is that, say there's a person that doesn't have that heart, that is trying to walk with God to keep his statues. Say they want to go worship at the temple and they come up. Of course, when they see these people there changing money, they're going to be attacked by the devil. And what I mean by that is they're going to have a thought run through their head saying, Oh, hey, did you, what about that sin that you might have committed? You might have been a little bit wrong over there. So maybe you should go ahead and buy this pigeon just in case, right? So they're going to be convicted. So on the one hand, you have worshipers going to the temple who are hyper convicted and just beating themselves up and buying animals for sacrificial purposes that maybe they didn't actually sin against God. And he's like, what are you doing? And then you have the other side of that picture. You have people going up to the temple to worship walking in greasy grace saying oh it's fine i can just buy the best sacrificial animal and it's fine what i did last week is no problem you understand there's two very juxtaposed heart conditions by these people who are visiting the temple so when jesus comes in matthew 21 and he is flipping over the tables of these people who are enabling these two heart conditions he is pissed. And I don't mean to be disrespectful to our Lord, but he is righteously indignant. How's that? Okay. He's furious and he's right. And he's without sin. So he is mad about it. And he says, he quotes Isaiah. He says, my house be called the house of prayer. What is he saying? He's saying, I wanted it for these people to come in and to seek me and to say, Lord, Oh my God, I'm so sorry for what I did. Or, hey Lord, can you give me some wisdom on this? I've been living good and I know, but I but somehow I'm still missing it, Lord. I know that we've got it lined out over here, but I'm missing it over here. He wanted people to come to the temple and pray to him and talk to him. But these people who were buying and selling were making it hard for people who had real heart needs, real 
spiritual needs, real physical needs, real needs to come to God and to get close and intimate with Him, okay? Here's how it impacts your life and catch this because this is big. This is a good word and it's a preachy word, okay? So catch this. When Jesus did this, He clears out the temple, right? Then the blind come to Him and He heals them. Then the lame come to Him and He heals them. They have to be led. The blind have to be led. The lame have to be carried, right? So I want you to think about this metaphorically. I want you to think about everything I've just told you about what this money exchange for sacrifice caused in the hearts of those people in the Old Testament. Now I want you to turn it and think about it in your own life. As a reborn Christian or hopefully reborn, you need to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, confess that out of your mouth, and accept your salvation. Okay, moving on from my evangelism platform here. What I want you to do is I want you to think about everything I told you in terms of a new Christian, a new creation, a New Testament believer. You are not under the law. So you don't have to approach God thinking, oh, what did I do now? Like the people who walk up to the temple, right? And they see those sellers of sacrificial animals and they're like, oh, I wonder if this was wrong or that was wrong. You're not under that anymore. You don't have to approach God going, oh, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? And go through all this sacrificing. Oh, I have to read more. I have to pray more. I have to serve more. So on the one hand, you don't have to do that to receive your sight to receive your ability to walk out what God has called and created you to do. You don't have to do that. You're set free from that. And on the other hand, you're set free from arrogance. You're set free from saying, oh, well, Jesus paid everything so I can just do what I want. No, you're set free from sin so that you cannot allow yourself to be, you cannot remain convinced that you just sinned because Jesus set you free. And so there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. In other words, unless you accept what Jesus Christ did on the cross, there's no other way you can get it. So you can't say, I'm gonna party like hell on Friday night or on Thursday night, and then I'm just gonna go to my church and say 25 Hail Marys, or I'm just gonna go to my church and confess, or I'm just gonna give to, to the offering plate when it comes by a big $50 bill and pay the professional Christians to approach God for me. You are set free from that type of behavior. And Jesus did that. So what Jesus did in the temple that day was so symbolic, not only for them in the Old Testament, but for us in the New Testament. He set you free from a heart condition that says, I have greasy grace, I can do whatever I want and sin however I want because all I have to do is go to church or all I have to do is just say, oh yeah, Jesus has got me. He set you free from that end of the spectrum as well he set you free from the other end of the spectrum that everything you do is wrong and all the time you have to get it under the blood and you have to read your Bible more and pray more and all this stuff. He set you free from all of that. He violently set you free. He violently took back your heart. And you have got to understand that as He is, so are you in this world. So because Jesus violently set you free, you can violently be made free. And you need to take a hold of your heart. You need to take a hold of your mental condition. And you need to say, uh-uh, I am set free. And you need to get violent. Because there is no longer a changer setting up outside the temple to make you feel guilty or to make you feel so arrogant that you can get away with everything and you don't have to honor God. When you come to God, the temple is now you. You are the temple of the living God, according to Corinthians. When you come to God with the understanding that you are His temple and that you've been set free from greasy grace, you've been set free from hyper-legalism, that you can come to Jesus and He immediately has healed your blindness and he's healed your lameness so you can see clearly what he's done for you and what you are and you can walk out what he's done for you and what you are you can come freely back and forth to the core of yourself where Jesus Christ resides and you can receive healing from him anytime you can be a house of prayer not only for your own life but for the lives of those around you, people can come to you and they can encounter Jesus. You can go inside your own heart and encounter Jesus. You are no longer blind. You are no longer lame. You no longer have to feel guilty and think you have to pray 25 hours a day and do this and do that and not do this and not do that. And you're also not so arrogant to think, well, I don't have to do anything. 
because Jesus did everything. He did do everything. But there are there should be a heart change. There should be a humility that just automatically comes on you. If you're in a position where you're blind and you can't see what Jesus did, and so you think that you have to do all these things, or you're blind and you can't see what Jesus did, and you say, well, I don't have to do anything because Jesus did everything. Let me tell you that Jesus turned over the table of those money changers, and then he healed the blind. And if you are of that mindset that you can't walk out the power of God because you haven't done this and haven't done that, you have been healed of that lameness. You have the power to walk out what God called and created you to walk out. If you are of the mindset that Jesus did everything and therefore you don't have to do anything, that is over with. You have been healed of your lameness and now you are responsible for walking out of the temple, going forth and sharing what Jesus Christ did for you. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Oh, I did mention that I was going to mention verse 15, Matthew 21, verse 15. Very interesting. Right after Jesus did all this, the Bible says that the religious leaders rebuked him for the wonderful works that he did. The point I'm trying to make is that God called, flipping over the tables, getting the buying and selling out of there, making an open space for the true worshipers of God to come to God to receive healing and to pray for wonderful works. Think about that for a while. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up. Sorry I got a little heated. Remember that I love you and that Jesus loves you.